We are going to be starting a new series today, and before I let you in on what the title of the series is, I want to take you to a passage of Scripture. It's found in Hebrews chapter 12. In the first two verses of Hebrews chapter 12, this is what it says. It says, Therefore, since we have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eye on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. This is the basis for the title of the series, and I've entitled the series, The Cloud, and and the series is really based on the people that are mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11. But in chapter 12, right after Hebrews 11, it gives all of these, um, uh, Hebrews 11 gives all of these heroes of the faith, and then chapter 12 says, therefore, since you are surrounded by this large cloud of witnesses... And it is the writer's way of, of, of kind of painting this picture for us, this, this illustration. It is this illusion that this cloud is like all these faithful hero, heroes of, of God's people that have come and they've gathered in this arena. And all of us are down there still in the competition. And these faithful uh, arena gatherers are proclaiming God's greatness. They're cheering us on. They're encouraging, encouraging us by their uh, example, and they're motivating all of us to keep on running. This cloud is like the cheerleading squad, the fans that are just cheering us on. And so that's what we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks. We're going to be looking at some of, we're not going to get all of the heroes of the faith that are mentioned in Hebrews 11. And it's my prayer that not only as we listen to their stories and hear what God commends them on, that not only will it encourage us and inspire us, but it would motivate us to live that type of life. It would motivate us to step out and to be a hero in the faith. Now, nearly 200 years ago, there were two Scottish brothers named John and David Livingstone. John had set his mind on making money and becoming wealthy, and John did just that. In fact, under his name in the old edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, by the way, I have to stop right here. If you are younger than me, the Encyclopedia Britannica was a group of books that came, some people bought them and they're at their house or maybe they're in your classroom, and you could go to those books and learn information. It was like the early Google of our world. That's what it was. And so you could go look things up in the Encyclopedia Britannica, But nonetheless, in an early edition of that, uh, John's uh, listing simply said this, the brother of David Livingstone. Now, who is David Livingstone? Well, while John had dedicated himself to making money, David had knelt and prayed and surrendered himself to Christ. He resolved, he said, I will place no value on anything I have or possess unless it is in relationship to the kingdom of God. In fact, the inscription over his burial place in Westminster Abbey reads, for 30 years of his life was spent in an unwearied effort to evangelize. Now on his 59th birthday, I've not gotten there yet, I've still got quite a few years left, but I'm heading that direction. On his 59th birthday, David Livingstone wrote this, He said, my Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I again dedicate my whole self to thee. My Jesus, my King, my life, my all, I again dedicate my whole self to thee. That's really what this series is about, us dedicating ourselves completely to Jesus, no matter what our age no matter where we stand, no matter how long we've been a Christian, dedicating ourselves to the Lord. So as we begin this series, let me ask you, are are you a John or are you a David? Because it makes a huge difference. Are we a John's or are we David's? Now as Christians, we have been called to live a life 
as a hero for the Lord. We've been called to live out our faith in such a way that others would see it and want to know more about it. We've been called to action. We've been called to get out there and tell and share and proclaim what Jesus has done in our lives. In fact, as Christians, we've been called to always move forward in our walk of faith. There is no retirement or sitting still in the Christian walk. Living in faith is often talked about, but seldom actually done. Because sometimes we confuse it. We, we've decided that faith was this proclamation, this affirmation of some, some list of things that we believe when it's mo so much more than that. It's a daily choice of how we are going to live. In fact, Hebrews 11, right before the heroes of the faith, it describes faith. It gives us this definition of faith. It says this, Faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. It gives us assurance about things we cannot see. The, the Hebrew writer says, hey, you've got to understand, faith is, is something that should be transforming your lives because it, it is you basing your life on a knowledge that you know is true even if you cannot see it. It is trusting in promises that God has made even if you can't perceive how they're all going to get accomplished. It's living in a way that no longer is uh, slaves to fear. It's living differently than our world. Faith is the ingredient that, that takes the flawed and the sinful and the wrecked, wretched person like myself, and it enables them to be used as heroes in the kingdom of God. Us walking in faith does that. In fact, I was thinking about that thought and, and this verse came to mind, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. It says, for, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do good things. He planned for us long ago. I love that. It's like God takes our life and because of Jesus, He recreates us. He, he changes us. It's like He takes all the broken pieces of my life and He puts them back together in this beautiful mosaic that, that brings in glory. And that points to him. And so for the next few weeks, that's what we're looking at. We're going, to looking at, we're going to be looking at faith and action in the lives of these kingdom heroes. Now, not all of them, but some of them. And it is my prayer, it's been my prayer ever since I started working on this, that, that we would be able to follow their example and that we could join in the cloud, that we could be part of the cloud in, in our efforts, but also in our encouragement of others. So keep that in mind. We're going to look at the very first hero that is mentioned in Hebrews 11 by name, and it's found in Hebrews 11, verse 4. Let me read to you who it is. Hebrews 11, 4, it was by faith that Abel brought a more acceptable offering to God than Cain did. Abel's offering gave evidence that he was a righteous man, and God showed his approval of his gifts. Although Abel is long dead, he still speaks to us by his example of faith. The very first hero of the faith is Abel in Hebrews 11. Now you might be thinking to yourself, all of the heroes of the faith, you probably wouldn't have thought to yourself, I'm going to pick Abel. Abel's the first one. He's at the top of the list. But here he is right at the top of the list. And the very first personal display of faith recorded here is worship. So we have Abel, who we probably wouldn't have picked, and then the expression of faith that makes a kingdom hero is worship, which we probably wouldn't have picked. We usually think that worship is something that we could easily do. You know, worship's no big deal, right? Well, it may not be a big deal the way we're doing it, but it should be a big deal. It should be a huge deal in our lives. So in order to get a little bit more uh, understanding of what's going on here, let's go back to Genesis chapter 4. That's where we find Abel and his brother Cain. This is where it says, verse 1, we'll read from verse 1. The story goes beyond what we're going to read. You can read the rest of it, but this is what it says. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, 
the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Now this is the, the incident of faith that is being referred to in Hebrews chapter 11. Abel and Cain, they both come to worship God. They're both there at the right time. They're both offering a sacrifice. But one is accepted and the other isn't. And by the way, we know the story and how it goes on. Cain is so upset that his gift is not accepted that he rages against his brother. Notice he doesn't look at himself, but he rages against his brother. And as you remember, he picks up a rock and kills him out in the field one day. So what made Cain's worship unacceptable and Abel's worship an act of faith? Not only an act of faith, an act of faith that catapulted him into the very heroes of the faith listed off in Hebrews chapter 11. Now there's been a lot of debate on this over the centuries. People are still debating on what made Cain's not a good sacrifice, not a good act of worship, and Abel's an acceptable and a good act of worship. Some have said that it was the type of offering. You know, Abel gave a blood sacrifice, you know, an animal sacrifice, while Cain gave just fruits and, and, and grain. I do want to clear something up. When we think about Old Testament sacrifice, almost always we think about animal sacrifice. But throughout the Old Testament, there were grain sacrifices as well. I just want you to know that. So there are places where that is an acceptable sacrifice. Others have argued, well, it wasn't necessarily what was brought, it was how it was brought, meaning the attitude by which it was brought. Cain must have brought it with grudgingly, and, and, and Abel gave it with gratitude. And as I thought about it, I thought, well, we could discuss this for a long time, but I, I truly think it's really both of those things. It was the type of, of gift and the attitude behind the gift. Which led me to the very first thing we need to recognize about worship. If we want to be people of faith who worship properly, who worship in a way that, that is uh, acceptable, then we need to be worshiping to please God. We need to worship to please God. Notice, the person we're trying to please is God. My name's not on the screen. And no one else's is either. We're here to Worship and please God. Now, without knowing exactly what God may have instructed them about what they should do when they came to offer their sacrifices in worship, apparently Abel did what he was supposed to do. Hebrews 11 says that it, what Abraham did was the evidence of his righteousness. Now, I just want to clear something up. Sometimes we get so very caught up in words that we, we're like, well, what is the meaning of righteousness? There's a very simple meaning of righteousness. Righteousness essentially means doing what is right in the eyes of God. That's what it is, to please God with our lives, to do those things that God considers right. And Abel made it apparent by his actions that he was going to do what is right in the eyes of God and Cain must have made it about himself. Cain must have made it about himself. Ralph Emerson, or excuse me, Ralph Waldo Emerson famously said, what we are worshiping, we are becoming. Or in other words, our deities shape our identities. Some have called that the Emerson Law. So I want you to consider some people that are that we can see, take an uh, example from as far as the Emerson Law in their life. The evolutionary scientist Charles Darwin once wrote in his autobiography, my chief enjoyment and sole employment throughout life has been scientific work. From this work, he added, I am never idle, as it is the only thing which makes life endurable to me. What effect did devotion have? Uh, to scientific work on the person of Darwin? Well, up to the age of 30, poetry gave me great pleasure, he said, and I took intense delight in Shakespeare. But now, for many years, I found it so intolerably dull that it nauseated me. 
My mind seems to have become a kind of machine for grinding at general laws out of large collections of facts. This loss is a loss of happiness. I became a withered leaf for every subject except science, which he saw as a great evil. Now, compare him to Jonathan Edwards. At the age of 19, Edwards wrote, Resolve to cast my soul on the Lord Jesus Christ, to trust and confide in Him, and consecrate myself wholly to Him. Later in his life, Edwards reflected on how the object of his worship had affected his souls over the years. He said, It brought an inexpressible purity, brightness, peacefulness, and ravishment to my soul. In other words, it made the soul like a field or a garden. These two men had completely opposite deities that they worshipped. And one became a withered leaf, and the other became a garden. See, the object of our devotion shapes our very lives, transforms who we are. You, you can tell a lot about me by, by what, I, what I worship, what, what is at the forefront in Romans chapter 12, we're told this about worship. It says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all He has done for you. Let them be living and holy sacrifices, the kind He will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship Him. We're told by Paul, he says, you need, to, you need to surrender everything to God. Worship Him with all you have, even yourself. You need to give that as an offering to God and a living one at that, meaning day by day by day. Jesus says it like this in Mark chapter 12, verse 30. He says, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. He says that's the greatest commandment, to, to surrender yourself completely to God, to give Him everything, to give all of yourself, all of who you are. That's what worship, we're, we're supposed to worship to please God. And that's what Abel does. He worships to please God. Which led me to my second thought about worship. We find in Abel, worship demands our best. Worship demands our best. Now, this is kind of an extension of the first point. But in Genesis chapter 4, describing Abel's gift, it says that he brought the best portions of his firstborn lambs. Which means he gave the first and he gave the best. Which means he gave priority and he had given God the top position. The, he gave him the first, and he gave him the best, a priority of, of time and position. Think about that. He, God is in, should be in the supreme position in our lives, meaning he should be at the very top of our priority list. He should be at the very top of our most important list, always at the very top. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Verse 7, it says, you must each decide to, in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. I want to dissect that just a moment. He, he says, you must decide in your heart. It is a decision. It is, it is something that you make a priority of, giving. That is, financially giving. You made a priority. You, you've decided in advance. You gave at the beginning. You, you didn't wait to the end, and you decided at the end, well, at the end of this week, I, I wound up with, with $5. That's what God gets, 5 What I have left. Whoop, leftover. No, you didn't do that. You, you made a, a decision in advance. You said, this is what I'm going to give God. And then whatever's left, I'll figure it out. This is what he gets, number one. And then you, you decided in this verse the demeanor by which you were going to give, how, how much you value God, how, how, what position he holds in your life, because he wants a cheerful giver. He wants someone who's glad that they can give it. I want to give it to God because he means that much to me. He means that much to me. So I give him the first, and I give him my best. That's what I do. That's what I do. Marshall Shelley decided he wanted to give the best, a terrific, thoughtful anniversary gift to his wife. And so he thought about it for a long time, and he came up with what he thought was the perfect gift. He wrapped it up. He gave it to his wife. She unwrapped it. 
And when she unwrapped it and opened up the box, you know what was in there? A rain gauge. A rain gauge was in the box. In fact, she expressed this, a rain gauge for our anniversary? Now his reasoning went something like this. He envisioned her opening up this box and, and, and recognizing what a delight it should be, how, how she could nostalgically track the rain in their backyard because she had grown up the daughter of a farmer and she was always watching closely the weather. And so he was so impressed with his creativity that he wrapped up a rain gauge and gave it to his wife as a gift on their anniversary. He said, by the way, the rain gauge became a family joke <laughs> from then on. It is a classic example of the gift being enjoyed more by the giver than by the receiver. And what he said after that really caught my attention. He says, one word I hear a lot these days is authentic, as in we seek authentic worship. Usually this means we're trying to create an experience that helps worshipers feel something. He said, there's nothing wrong with that, and there isn't. But if our focus is only on our experience, we may be giving God a rain gauge. See, are we, are we offering in worship a gift we enjoy and figuring that God will take it? Or are we offering in worship a gift that we know that He wants? that is important to him. Abel offered a gift that God wanted. In Malachi chapter 1, verses 7 through 10, there's some very harsh verses there. This is what it says, You have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how, are, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defile them by saying the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. And when you give blind animals... As sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And isn't it wrong to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? Try giving gifts like that to your governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you. But when you bring that kind of offering, why should he show you any favor at all, asks the Lord of heaven's armies. And then he says, how I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of heaven's armies, and I will not accept your offerings. I mean, God calls for the gates of the temple to be closed, to be shut, rather than to receive from his people leftovers. So if you're bringing a leftover in, shut the gates of the temple. I don't want that. God is the God who gave his very best for you and me through his son, and we owe him the very best we have. We should give it back to him. And giving our best is not just about an amount on a check that we drop in the box. Giving our best is much more than that. It's, it's our energy, and it's our attention, and it's the way we speak, and it's the way we act, and it's the attitudes we have, and on and on we go. Are we giving God the best? Or is he just getting what's left? Which led me to my last point about worship that we see in Abel, and that is that worship should always point to Jesus. Now you are thinking, and, and rightly so, you're thinking, well, Abel predated Jesus by a lot, a long time before Jesus came along, and you are absolutely right. He predated Jesus a long time before Jesus came so what do I mean by this? Well, you got to understand that Abel brought an animal sacrifice. And it is, sim it is more than him just simply bringing what he had. That's, it's more than that. It was a recognition of the cost of sin. Because if you remember, his mom and dad, I'm sure they've told him this story, his mom and dad had sinned in the garden. And when God goes looking for them, they're hiding. Why are they hiding? You're allowed to say it. I'm, I'm popping, I think. It's because they're naked. If you say naked, it's okay. Because they're naked. That's what it is. They are without clothing. And so what does God do? God has to kill an animal, skin the animal, so that he can clothe Adam and Eve. An animal died to 
because of their sin. And I want you to understand, the entire Old Testament sacrificial system was always intended to point us to Jesus Christ. It was always intended to show us the gravity of our sin. It was supposed to show them, you sin and something dies. You sin and something dies again. You sin some more, more death. It was supposed to show us that over and over again so that we we would be looking for someone who could help us recognizing the great depth and devastation of our sin. In Hebrews 7, verse 27, it says this, Unlike those other high priests, he, meaning Jesus, does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They did this for their own sins and and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did it this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. See, in the Old Testament system, sacrifices had to be done over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And they never really dealt with the problem. They just held it back. They just pushed it back until Jesus came and dealt with it. But up until that point, it was just being held. It was just being held. The same is said in Galatians chapter 3. We are told this. It says, is there any conflict then between God's law and God's promises? Absolutely not. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But the scripture declares that we are all prisoners of sin, so we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. It is, it is all of those sacrifices, every sacrifice was pointing ahead to Jesus and our need for a Savior. That's what worship should always do point to our need for Jesus, point to how great our Jesus is. I've mentioned this once before, but there was a Hindu who tells the story of attending church for the first time as a teenage boy. He said the small group of Indian believers met in a very run-down house, but there was something very special about their worship. The small uh, song leader held up her tambourine, and when, when she hit her hand with it, and a new chorus had started. Over and over the words were repeated, and soon I had joined in. It was hard not to be enthusiastic if what the song said was true. Wonderful, wonderful Jesus is to me. Counselor, mighty God, Prince of Peace is He. Saving me, keeping me from all sin and shame. Wonderful is my Redeemer. Praise His name. He said no one had started preaching, but already I had learned so very much. What a contrast between the relationship these Christians had with Jesus and the ritualistic appeasement of the gods at Hindu ceremonies. I had never heard anyone say that the Hindu God was a wonderful or a counselor. Certainly, no one said that of Shiva or Kali or his bloodthirsty wife or their favorite son, and I'm probably saying this wrong, Ganesha, half elephant and half human. But they called Jesus the Prince of Peace. And he said that the words of that simple chorus were burning themselves into my heart. Jesus would not only save, but could keep me from all sin and shame. What good news. And then, this is what really struck me. He said, these people must have found it to be true, or they wouldn't be singing it with such enthusiastic joy. We've come here today to celebrate what Jesus has done and to declare to the world that he is the only God and the only way. And he, it is a declaration of our faith when we worship him. And and it should be worshiped not just in voices lifted up, but it should be hearts lifted up and, and emotions on fire because God is great and he has done great things for you and for me. See, Abel expressed his faith in a God-pleasing way. He gave his best. He realized the depth of his sin and that it needed to be covered by blood. Our lives should be proclaiming the same thing. When we worship today, did we declare that we wanted to please God? When we worship today, did did we give, offer the best we had? Were we focused on Jesus and what He did for us and what He could do for others? 
Hebrews 12, verse 28, one last verse. This is what it says. Since we are receiving a kingdom that is unshakable, let us be thankful and please God by worshiping Him with holy fear and awe. See, faith must be seen in our worship. Abel was able to show that. Are you able? Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come to worship you today. And I pray, Lord, that our worship has been pleasing to you. And not just today, but the worship we present to you today and every day of our lives. And Lord, it is my prayer that we bring our very best. Best of our energies, best of our resources, best of our talents, best of all we are, our times. And we'll give it to you. And Lord, I pray that, that it will always be pointing to Jesus, that our focus will be on Jesus and that we will point others to Jesus day by day and in the midst of our worship. God, you have blessed us so much and we look at this very first hero listed off in Hebrews 11 and he, Abel, is known for a hero of the faith because of his worship. Lord, I pray that the same can be said of each of us. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And I thank you that we could come today and worship together. And I thank you that each day we have the opportunity to worship you individually. And I pray this all in Jesus' name.